All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the ninth day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. Let me, I need to turn something down a little bit here. Uh, in my ears, not in yours. Uh, yeah, I have been cracking the volume up because I want to share a short video with you. It turns out I've entered into a war with a particular doctrine of the atonement, which is a nullification of the atonement. It's occurred to me as I looked into it at reading. Now, I did not, I was pre, I did not begin this war, okay? Uh, the other day, several days ago, I just happened to open this book, which I happen to have. I mean, it's a few spare minutes. I <laughs> wanted to, oh, redeem the time. And I opened this book randomly to page 115, uh, J. Kenneth Grider's A Wesleyan Holiness Theology, long-time professor uh, at uh, uh, Nazarene Theological Seminary, wrote many uh, books, uh, articles, everything else. I mean, if uh, this is probably the textbook that's being used there now. I have no indication. Well, I have indications that he was. Well, he'd be right in the middle of it today. Uh, just fine with the way the world's going. But uh, in this book, when I opened 115, it was a, the heading. It was happened to be a, a section heading. It was uh, the righteousness of God. I think, oh, that's that should be edifying. And I started reading that. And I thought. What in the world is going on here? Because he explicitly denies that righteousness, otherwise we could tra translate it as justice, and love are attributes of God's nature. In other, in other words, they are what God is. He said, no, they're just what God does. Really? So if God is not righteous, where does righteousness come from? Huh? If it's not the self-expression of God, what is it? I mean, th this man, he is shallow. I mean, he doesn't think, um, but uh, it was, and the, the idea that love, you know, God is love. He said, no, God's not really love. That's not part of his essential being. He, that's just something we use to describe what God does. Contrary to 2,000 years of Christian theology and history and tradition and, and the entire Bible. So he just, you know, it really annoys me when theologians just say things that have no grounding in Scripture. They just, this is my opinion, and you better accept it. I mean, I mean, if you're a professor in a, in a seminary, in other words, if you don't believe what I say, you're not going to graduate. Uh, and so I thought, I thought this is this is outrageous. I've never heard anything like this. I mean, you won't find this in the Catholic Catechism, or, or, or you won't find Aquinas saying this, or any of the reformers, or anybody, Orthodox at all in any sense. And so I decided, well, if he says this here, I wonder what he says about the atonement, because that's a central issue in Christianity. I mean, <laughs> put it this way. You go to a Roman Catholic church or an Orthodox church, what is the central thing of worship in those churches? And other churches, Anglican, Lutheran, Usually reformed. 
I mean, what's the central thing? I, uh, often every single time, you know, every Sunday. It's the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. What was it? His death. His death as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Greider doesn't believe that. Doesn't believe that. He doesn't believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, bearing our punishment upon the cross. That is the gospel, brothers and sisters. If you don't believe that, you do not have Christ. You are not a Christian. Well, Greider holds to what has been reported to be the, uh, the idea of Grotius, a, a disciple of Arminius, and uh, th that basically it was, no, no, Jesus died on the cross in order for God to demonstrate uh, his uh, concern about sin. Just a demonstration. So how do so so God sent his own son into the world in order to execute him as a criminal when in fact he was innocent as a demonstration of God's justice and righteousness really please explain how that makes any sense it doesn't it doesn't make any sense at all. If you hold to that theory of the atonement, it's not an atonement at all. You know, why were there, how, who knows how many millions and millions and millions of animals were sacrificed in the Old Testament on God's command if there is no substitutionary atonement? What was the point? It was not a foreshadowing of what God's own son would do. I mean, there's many people that hate it, hate the idea, but they're not Christians. I mean, that's the central fact of Christianity. If there is no atonement, the resurrection doesn't mean anything either. What, what's it all about? If there is no atonement, you are in your sins to this very day. And over the years, as I thought back over my acquaintance with Nazarenes and my growing concern about what I'm not hearing on Sunday mornings at the one I've been attending for almost a year now, not as a member, no way, Jose. No, 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 you're not. No, I, at one time I even considered becoming a Nazarene pastor, but like, as I looked into it, no, you mean I have to sub, sub, subject myself to the district superintendent, follow their orders? No way. I belong to Christ. He is my Lord. I'm not going to kiss the ring of a DS, otherwise known as a bishop. They just changed the name. But uh, they're Methodists. <laughs> they're, they're Methodist sect is what they are. Uh, that emphasizes Wesley's aberrant theology, not his sound. By the way, uh, Wesley believed in substitution, in penal substitutionary atonement. That was not one of Wesley's errors, but apparently his followers didn't like that. So many of them have abandoned that. And, you know, uh, and I look back in the, in the, as I've looked into this, I looked back in the Nazarene handbook, which I couldn't find. I don't know where I put it now, it's around here someplace. And they refer to it, they say, you know, and it deceives people. The devil is deceptive. He, he uses slippery language. So it sounds orthodox, but it doesn't. It says, it, it says that Christ suffered for us on the cross. Not died for us in our place. Well, and looking at, at uh, Grider's arguments, I have to say Grider was a deceiver. Willfully so. You can't say he was totally ignorant of the Bible. I mean, no, he was a deceiver. Uh, which means he was unregenerate, doesn't it? I mean, this, this is not like, this is, you know, when you spend your life teaching a false doctrine, trying to nullify the cross, because 
the governmental theory, if you put that forward as a substitute, now if you put that forward as a secondary purpose, you know, like Christ, Christus Victor, Victor or Christ the Victor and the other uh, explanations for it. Now, they can supplement substitutionary town because God has manifold. His wisdom is manifold. It's not just one track, you know. But the main thing, what's the main thing? Substitutionary atonement. And if you deny, see, but this man is vociferous in his opposition to the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. He tries to smear it as Calvinist. Well, Calvinists believe that. But so do a lot of others, including all Baptists that I know of, and all Lutherans that I know of, and all Anglicans that I know of, and all Evangelicals. So this puts, now see, this is one of those, it's like the Jehovah's Witnesses that come to your door. They don't come to your door and knock, knock, knock. Hi, we represent the Jehovah's Witnesses, and we do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. They don't come out front with their doctrine, do they? They don't come up out front and say, listen to us because we have this whole package of lies we want to give you that, that would demonstrate that we're not Christians at all. No, they, they want to deceive you. They're deceivers. The devil is a deceiver. And all, so are his children. But Grider here uh, deliberately wants to, to smear the doctrine of substitutionary atonement as Calvinist, as if it's exclusively Calvinist. Because Calvinists are a small minority of Christians small minority of Christians. It, it's just absurd, as, as I was mentioning, that, that uh, the Orthodox and uh, Roman Catholics, in spite of the, the accretions of false doctrine and tradition over the centuries, the central rite of their worship, the focus of their service, is the substitutionary atonement of Christ. What does the Mass mean if Jesus didn't die for your sins? It means nothing. It's, it's a bunch of idiocy. Why, why go to all the arguments about whether the bread becomes the body and blood of Christ? If there's no atonement there, see the, the argument, all those arguments about is how do we receive the benefits of Christ's atonement? See, the arguments between Protestants and Catholics is about the essential argument is about how do we receive the benefit of the atonement? Is it do we receive it through the church and the sacraments of the church? I have to say Lutherans and Anglicans are more confused than Calvinists on this. Uh, Lutherans aren't consistent. <laughs> Luther wasn't consistent. It was a problem with Luther. Uh, he, he, there's things, you know, it, it, he was steeped in Roman Catholicism, and it's hard to get rid of things you've been raised in your whole life. But the, the real base argument is not about whether Christ died for our sins. All Christians believe that, died in our place. Although the, the Catholics nowadays are getting squishy, you know, <laughs> they got over there. Uh, in, in some ways, because of the mischaracterization of certain parts of it by certain Calvinists. I, I would really, you know, Paul Washer is one that I'm familiar with that really goes over the top with emphasizing God's wrath and how Jesus interposed himself and swallowed up the wrath of God. No! Stupid! For God so loved the world he sent his Son to deliver us from his wrath, from the necessary wrath of his justice and the law. How can a just God save sinners? That's what the cross is all about. But there's people there that apparently hate it, including Greider. So you, you accept these, these theories that allow you to, to avoid the cross, to avoid the gospel. And I've, I've been, this was, as I've been thinking about some of these things, and this was sort of a later edition, and a lot of things went click, 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 click when I saw what Greider was saying. 
Because over the years, I've noticed in my acquaintance with Nazarenes, and I haven't had a, an ongoing acquaintance with Nazarenes, but when I was pastoring north of here, I had uh, a friend that was a retired Nazarene preacher. In fact, he had filled in at that church several times over its because had inability to keep a pastor very long. But uh, uh, it's one of these things that really is not talked about openly. It's sort of like Calvinists and their eternal predestination of exhaustive eternal predestination of all things. Like, like even the, the Westminster Confession says, this has to be handled carefully. Yeah, it's like kryptonite. It's toxic. Because people will see that and say, no way, Jose. It's like the Mormon doctrines. And, and, yeah, why don't you come up to, to, your, to the door and talk about your holy underwear that Mitt Romney wore or wears? Temple Mormon. <laughs> now, that has a. Now, Catholics have things like that, too the brown and the green scapula. But that is not part of historic Christianity or historic Catholic. Uh, stuff. I mean, even the transubstantiation of the Mass only goes back about a thousand years. I mean, it's, that's why Pope Francis hates this, this green book over here. Uh, Denziger's the sources of Catholic dogma. Now, Denziger is a Catholic. This is this is an official Catholic. It has the imprimatur and everything else in the front. So when you're going to, and, and this is why I want to show you this this little video, but uh, I'm going to sh show you when I stop talking. But I, I see once I read that thing about God's nature in this that says I got to read more and then I looked at the atonement because that's a central element I have to say uh, I'm going to show the, the video was done by by William Lane Craig it's like four minutes long uh, and I'm not a big fan of William Lane Craig but he's right on the atonement and he he want he'll point out something about the uh, uh, the false attribution of the governmental theory to Grotius, which is always regarded as the origin of it. Uh, in passing, yesterday I looked, at, I've got this book of Arminian Theology by Roger E. William, uh, Olson, Williams, Olson, which isn't really uh, Arminian Theology. <laughs> It's just a, an apologetic for it. It's basically says it's like supposedly dispelling myths about Arminian theology. But I, I looked at uh, Olson a little bit. And, uh, he 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 and he won't even talk to James White. <laughs> uh, but uh, he did do a semi debate with uh, uh, Horton. can't remember Horton's full name. Michael, is it Michael Horton? Too many Michaels out there. My memory gets confused. It's like, is that Michael Horton? Or, anyway, uh, about uh, Calvinism versus uh, Arminianism. Now, there's a lot of false things said about Arminianism. If you actually go back and read the, the remonstrance that led to the, uh, uh, the Synod of Dort, condemnation. They're not unbiblical. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean other things that came out of it weren't, but, you know, I've, I've heard over the years, always Grotius, Grotius, a d disciple of Arminius that came up with this uh, um, governmental theory of the atonement, which is why I want to show you this video. But as I went from this guy, and I said, well, I wonder if uh, Roger Olson holds to that uh, view too, yeah he does, that's his preferred view, but he unlike see, Grider's absolutely hostile towards substitutionary atonement. Olson is like the government is his theorem is his preferred. 
In other words, he's not denying the, val the validity of the other. He really can't because that's his historic Christian view, contrary to what liars say. And the more I th look at what how Greider handles things and Scripture and everything else, truth, how he handles it, it's like this guy is satanic. See, Satan comes dressed as an angel of light, you know, like a a, a long time highly honored. Professor of Theology at Nazarene Theological Seminary. And I also know about his unpublished book. <clears throat> you know, there's the people that aren't actually Christians tend to have a downward trajectory. They can fake it for a long time, but eventually their true nature comes out. And looking at this, and I, I was thinking, Oh, how, how many things have I seen among Nazarenes that that's why, that's why, that's why. They don't really have the atonement. They don't trust in Christ's righteousness. That's the whole movement from the beginning. And that's why I'm really dubious about Wesley's salvation because you can hold orthodox doctrine but not have Christ, not have the atonement. Because he was he was always, you know, his holiness club, everything else before his conversion, he never dropped the holiness club stuff. He never, he's always continued in this pursuit of personal holiness. Now, not that personal holiness is bad, but when you, when you, when your life indicates that you're trusting in that rather than in Christ and what he did for you on the cross, that you're trying to establish your own righteousness before God. And I keep hearing these little snippets, including where I've been attending, that, that indicates to me is like, what what is he trust the pastor? What is he trusting in? Or he'll make a, uh, not too long ago, he made a, some comment that just indicated to me that there's something wrong here. And the constant, you know, do better, do better, do better kind of stuff. But not the cross. There's no foundation for Christian holiness in what I've been hearing. Now, the, the new covenant has a promise has promises of God sanctifying us. You don't have to sanctify yourself. God does it. You just, you're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by works. But why is it so hard to get that through people's heads? It's just they naturally want to go to self-righteousness, which is a really bad place to go. So that's why it's an anti-gospel. It's an anti -gospel. And the, the, uh, the governmental theory as it is set forth well, it, said, it basically says this, is that Christ did not die on the cross as a result of our sins, that he took our punishment upon himself, that our sin was uh, counted to him and the punishment was applied to him rather than to us so that God could be free having satisfied his law and his justice do not treat us as sinners and give us our just deserts, which is hell, eternal punishment. No, no. So God could, 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 and God ordained that salvation will be by grace through faith and not of works. That's one of his decrees right there. So if you... To, 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 to substitute, to take that away and say, oh, I hate that. And rather say, no, Jesus just died for God to make a demonstration how seriously he takes sin. Well, how is sending your own son into the world, sinless son, and then executing him on a cross as a criminal, an innocent man for what he didn't do. 
just to make a demonstration. What kind of dem does what does God that demonstrate except God's injustice? God's injustice. In other words, there was no greater purpose than just making some demonstration about taking sin seriously. Wasn't the global flood of Noah enough? Wasn't Sodom and Gomorrah a demonstration enough that you take sin seriously? Wasn't exiling Israel into Babylon enough? Apparently not. No, no, I'm going to execute an innocent man. My own son. And how does that demonstrate God's taking sin seriously? It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense at all. Which means it's really satanic. Jesus did not die. And then Olson, or not Olson, excuse me. <laughs> Greider also says that, that Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. God could have done the atonement some other way. What atonement? There's no atonement. Well, if you don't believe in a substitutionary atonement, yeah, I mean, God could have done all kinds of demonstrations. In fact, he did. So what Greider has done is removed the very core from Christianity. He's gutted Christianity and left you with your self-righteousness. Jesus is what? What is he? What is he? He's not a savior. He can't deliver you from your sin. You've got to deliver yourself from your sin. You've got to be entirely sanctified. It is absurd. It's anti-Christianity. And I've known Nazarenes and their insecurity. I mean, when they confide to you as a friend, a fellow fellow believer, and they and they, they, they share their fears with you. It's like, wait a minute. And you wonder, what, why? Why? Why can't they rest in Christ and what he did on the cross? Because they're not taught to. They're, the gospel is not being preached, I believe, in most Nazarene churches. Now, I don't believe that they require anyone to believe in the, the false gospel to be a Nazarene. But, the, see, if you join the Nazarene church, you have to agree to uphold their rule book, which includes the, the American Holiness Code. No, no smoking, no drinking, no dancing, no going to movies, no playing cards. That's the original one. Uh, women can't wear gold, including a wedding, a wedding band. You know, all this... All these um, man-made rules. You have to say, yeah, I'll do that, including the storehouse tithe. Oh, we know where the storehouse is, you know, the, the, which is nothing but Old Testament law. And if you follow the Old Testament tithing law, it doesn't go to the church anyway. <laughs> oh, man, the, the, the inability to distinguish between law and gospel? There is a problem Calvinists have, too. They can't distinguish. They have a problem because they think the gospel, the law, is of grace, even though Paul says it's not of grace. It's not of faith. <sighs> it's of works. You have to do the things of the. He that uh, does the law shall live by it. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Uh, but anyway, uh, what I wanted to point out here, uh, yeah, I'm at war with this doctrine now, but I wanted to point out uh, something I saw this morning by William Lane Craig about the dangers of not going to original sources. The reason I have shelves full of of commentaries and catechism stuff like, you know, I've got, and I've got on the computer, if I don't buy the stuff because it's terribly expensive, it's like I can look up the original sources of the church fathers or uh, whatever. I, I do prefer paper. But but so you can go back and see what was really said and not what somebody tells you was said. Because we should have all uh, be aware of there's a lot of liars and deceivers out there 
who are not very particular about the, how they handle other people's words, including so-called Christians, like J.D. Hall was notorious for that. In fact, he was rebuked by several Christians, I being one of them. And what do we get for our, our trouble? Mockery. <laughs> Rather than responding as a brother in Christ, he just mocks you, or he did. Now he's off, and who knows where he is because he's been kicked out of his church. The pastor has been excommunicated from his church out there in Montana. Well, he's getting farther and farther away, too. You leaving the go preaching of the gospel to uh, to get meddle in politics and and having a mouth you can't control at all. You know, not, nothing like going out and deliberately insulting people with confused sexuality. You know, we could just say, you know, you really need Jesus. I think you need Jesus. <laughs> he could help you. You don't, you don't have to be obnoxious. <sighs> All right. So let's play this video, or try to play it. Let's see. Uh, will this help if I do that? We'll see. It might not. Uh, I'll adjust it as we go. Um, yeah, the audio is not too good. I don't think... You, talking into a laptop is not will not produce good audio. Hello, thank you for joining me in my study. As you can hear. Last echo. time, I shared my amazement at the discovery that St. Anselm's satisfaction theory of the atonement has been so seriously misrepresented in the secondary literature. Well, history seems to have a way of repeating itself. This past week, I've been reading a treatise by the great international jurist and lawyer Hugo Grotius, who lived from about... Okay, let me comment. Yeah, misrepresenting sources, twisting other people's words uh, in order to, to uh, make your point. Yeah, that's uh, very common. But yeah, so... Uh, so Anselm had a the theory of the, uh, the the debt satisfaction, I believe, which is close to penal substitution. It's it's like the analogy of a debt that we owed that had to be paid, uh, which is you know very close. So uh, that is a, a satisfaction. Uh, it's it's you could say it's, it's see the difference is punishment for a crime versus it was a little bit. You know, it's, it's not unacceptable. It's not adequate, but it's not unacceptable as far as it goes. Most of these theories, as subsidiary to the 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 atonement, the the substitutionary atonement of Christ, are acceptable because the the, the scripture does have other themes besides just penal substitution. Uh, God's purpose in Christ as, as Christ the Victor, of course. Of course, but that's not the central purpose. Christ could have come as a conquering king, but he would have had to destroy everybody then. How can God accept sinful rebels? That's the question. God had to be both just. See, the uh, I hate to say it. I, I haven't actually read the book, too. I think Pip Piper wrote a, his doctoral theses on the justification of God, as in, God justifying himself, but I would hate to refer you to any anybody to that uh, without having actually read it. I think I have it, but I, it's like, uh, I hate to cut Stan Piper. He is so far off in so many things. But uh, he's popular because he's a hedonist, and our flesh likes it. Our flesh likes Piper. Uh God wants you to be, it, it's really, Piper is a Calvinist version of Joel Osteen. Ew. It's all about you, or, or Rick Warren. Just a highly doctrinal, see, he can, he, he's, Piper's really good. His mind is really good at, at, at using the scripture 
and twisting it in, in very subtle ways. Except when you call yourself a hedonist, that's not very subtle. But, yeah, you never did stop that. But anyway, that's, uh, but the idea of God's self-justification, too. And the Scripture talks about that. That, that. that God is sort of like God's on trial. And God has to justify himself publicly, too. But that's certainly not the major thing. The major th same theme is about how can a holy and righteous God save sinners who deserve hell, who, whose, whose righteousness and holiness demands they be punished? How can he, how can he justify, how can he reconcile himself? See, this is where Grider's corruption of God's nature comes in, too, where God is not by nature righteous or holy. Or he says he's holy but not righteous, which is idiocy right there. Uh, but the, the idea that God is not by nature just and righteous, well, then he wouldn't have to satisfy himself on the cross. Uh, let's see, what was his, I don't, I don't want to get into that book. Uh, there was a good book, uh, the title was The Cross of Christ by, I can't remember his name, well-known evangelical. I've got at least one copy of it around here. But it goes into these, these various theories of the atonement, too. The problem I have with some men like that is they're too ironic. I mean, you have to be a little hostile. When you're dealing with enemies of the cross, you have to be hostile. Because God's hostile. I mean, it's like Paul in Galatians. Anathema. And, 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 I mean, if Paul double anathematized, commanded the church to anathematize those who added one work, one commandment, to salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, well, then, what about somebody that gets guts the atonement itself? They weren't denying the atonement, <coughs> they were, but, but by de facto, <coughs> they were saying that, that Christ's atonement's not good enough. Excuse me. <coughs> uh. Anyway, back to... Back to uh, William Lane Craig, but I wanted to point out that, yeah, there's a whole lot of people out there all the time that do not, they'll, they'll cite sources, but not represent them accurately. About 1583 to 1645, Grotius wrote a treatise entitled A Defense of the Catholic Faith <clears throat> Concerning the Satisfaction of Christ against Faustus Socinus. Socinus was a Unitarian theologian who attacked the Reformer's <clears throat> doctrine of the atonement, and Grotius wrote in... Uh, let me make a point here. Socinus was an absolute heretic, uh, but <clears throat> I remember one church of Christ I visited, and there was an elder there. I was talking to him. And he was asking me if I was aware of Socinus and highly praising him. <coughs> he was a rationalist. <coughs> so these heretics still live among us in unsuspecting places. It's defense. In the secondary literature, you will find it often said that Grotius, rather than defending the reformer's view, offered an entirely new theory of the atonement and even betrayed the reformer's penal view of the atonement and gave in to Socinus. I found this to be a gross misrepresentation in reading Grotius himself. On the popular theory, Grotius' view is that Christ did not really pay the penalty for our sin. Rather, God inflicted suffering on Christ as a sort of example 
of how bad sin is, so that as the moral governor of the universe, he might persuade us to live upright and righteous lives before him. Christ's death was basically an example of how heinous sin is. Imagine my surprise then in reading Grotius to find that this is not at all what Hugo Grotius said. Let me just share with you a couple of passages from the defense which show clearly Grotius's belief that Christ paid the penalty for our sins. He says the Catholic doctrine, and by that he means the Christian doctrine, the Protestant doctrine, is as follows. <clears throat> God was moved by his own goodness to bestow distinguished blessings upon us. But since our sins, which deserved punishment, were an obstacle to this, he determined that Christ, being willing of his own love toward men, should, by bearing the most severe tortures and a bloody and ignominious death, pay the penalty for our sins in order that without prejudice to the exhibition of divine justice, we might be liberated upon the intervention of a true faith from the punishment of eternal death. Hugo Grotius then launches into a lengthy defense of the biblical basis for saying that Christ paid the punishment for our sins. And here is his summary statement of that case. To sum up what has been said, since the scripture says that Christ was chastised by God, that is, punished, that Christ bore our sins, that is, the punishment of sins, was made sin, that is, was subjected to the penalty of sins, was made a curse with God, or was exposed to the curse, that is, the penalty of the law, since, moreover, the very suffering of Christ, full of tortures, bloody, ignominious is the most appropriate matter of punishment since again the scripture says that these were inflicted on him by God on account of our sins that is our sins so deserving since death itself is said to be the wages that is the punishment of sin certainly it can by no means be doubted that with reference to God the suffering and death of Christ had the character of a punishment. Grotius's view is that God as the ruler of the universe did not have to punish Christ in order to forgive sins, but that he... Well, <clears throat> Grotius was wrong on that. Well, no, he didn't actually have to punish Christ, but he had to punish sin. Uh, that's probably sufficient. Only There's only about a uh, less than a minute, uh, 30 seconds left there. Uh, <clears throat> But yeah, he was uh, that that William Lane Craig was surprised to find out that all see all the sources uh, that that uh, support the the governmental theory base it on Grotius supposedly creating this. See, there's all kinds of lies in church history, and people just keep repeating the same lies. They believe it to be true, and they keep repeating it. But uh, the one of the fundamental points that he points out there is that the, the fundamental uh, the people that hold to the the governmental theory uh, they they object to Christ's death as punishment for our sins. They object that you can't impute one person's sins to another. Who says? Who says? So it's apparently these people think they're God. They're telling God what he can and, can and cannot do. Well, I'd like to point out that the scripture, it says God chose to shut up everyone under sin. Romans. In other words, God chose to shut, shut the entire human race under sin in order that he might have mercy on all. So if you're going to, to condemn God, first of all, you better understand what he says about what he's done and why he's done it. I've spent 46 years trying to understand those things. And every time I look at the scripture, I learn something new, and I learn something more. 
and I get a greater understanding that it becomes more and more cohesive. It's not just random facts and random verses. It's like the pictures that like a puzzle, a, a jigsaw puzzle, it's coming together more and more and more. But without the substitutionary atonement of Christ, you've got nothing at all. And then the cross makes no sense at all. No wonder people are atheists and they say, well, he was just a criminal. The, the Romans regarded him as a, as a dissident and a rebel and a troublemaker, and they didn't care about who they killed anyway. So he just got caught in that, and they executed him. Well, I can see why people believe that. Especially if you've been exposed to a to to ideas by people like Grider and uh, maybe Olson. That this whole theory that there's there's some uh, street preachers on the internet that that are really into this crap. Uh, followers of Finney. Now Finney, let's, let's be clear. Finney was ordained as a Presbyterian. Uh, <laughs> This is bad. Uh, but he, he, Finney said we stand in our own righteousness, and I'm afraid. That's what a lot of Nazarenes actually believe, too, even even if they do not, uh, do not enunciate that with clarity. Their practice, their, their fears um, indicate that. I mean, that is where... You know, what Christians believe before they become born again. They don't know Christ. They don't know the gospel. So they they, they tend to, to go to this, oh, I sinned. At a church of Christ, this is traditional churches of Christ. It is you sin. God can forgive you if you ask. So you ask. You sin again. You ask again. You sin again. You ask again. But you're never delivered from the bondage of sin. You never can rest because you you're the fear of of God's uh, judgment and hell continue to hang over you because you might you might die with unconfessed sin. It's it's you're not you're not forgiven by confession. You're forgiven by faith in Christ by abiding in Christ. He is your atonement. He's, he, he, he satisfied all your sins, including those ones you haven't done yet, and you will do more. If you don't think so, you've deceived yourself. 2,000 years ago. Paid in full. But I do not recall hearing the gospel at that Nazarene church in the last, since I've started going there. And I, I, I remember... I was asked to, to fill in and preach a couple times. I remember one, I was preaching the gospel and the new covenant and, and how Christ purchased all this for us. And and the people in the in the congregation were like sort of screwing up their faces, you know, like, what is this? I'm thinking, this is, why are they looking at me like this? Like I'm saying something they haven't heard before. It could be because they hadn't heard it before. And just this little sound snippets now and then, you know, little things that come out of the pastor's mouth and reactions from the church about some things. And, you know, he's talking about the 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 final judgment. And I mean, their eschatology is a mess. You know, they don't believe that they're they're uh, amillennialists, I believe, um, in practice at least. And, but the idea that. There's no distinction between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. They have, it's like, so we almost, so the idea that everyone is going to be, in fact, one time he mentioned that, that he has a friend who says that, that because Christ died for our, well, how did it go? That, that because Christ died for our sins, we won't be at that judgment. Yeah, he's right. That guy's right. Christians aren't at the la last judgment as before the bar of judgment. We've, we're already glorified. 
the, we're already entirely sanctified then. And when Christ glorifies us, we're entire, that's when we're entirely sanctified. We will be there on the judgment throne, not in the dock. Like the scripture says, we shall judge angels. You know, all those fallen angels <laughs> that have been harassing you? It's like, aha. Uh -huh. I know it. Uh, but the, 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 this, the, this, the, the governmental... No, let me get back to the street. Uh, Jesse... What's his last name? I don't know. There's a street preacher out there that's done a lot of videos over the years. I don't know if he's still active doing it or not. And he preaches self-righteousness. He's a, like a, a follower of Finney. And uh, there, then there's more than one like that. They, they sound zealous. They're, they're like, they're like uh, Paul's description of the Pharisees or, or his countrymen. I bear them witness that they, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And not knowing about the righteousness of God, not subjecting themselves to God's righteousness, what he has prepared for us in Christ, they seek to establish their own righteousness through works. And I have to say, that's what many Nazarenes are doing. Many. And who knows how many other Christians, because this is like the fallback position for humanity, that the way to God is by making yourself acceptable to him. Well, you can't do that because his standard is perfect. You have to keep his law all the time. And all his law is hangs on two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And love your neighbor the same way you love yourself. And if you're not doing that, you're in violation of his law. Now, Christ went, delivered us from the law. We're not under the law's domination. We're not under the law's jurisdiction. Calvinists don't know that either. We're under Christ. He is our king. He dwells in us. As Paul says, those who are in the new covenant, who've been born again, the Spirit of God is in us, and God is at work in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. Salvation is God's work, not yours. It's his, Christ took the burden of your salvation upon himself and purchased a new covenant where God saves us. Because you can't save yourself. And if you understand that, if you trust in God, then you can relax. That doesn't mean, oh, let us go sin that grace may abound. You don't want to sin because God's changed your heart. You don't love that stuff anymore. You, although you still have sinful flesh that does. So there is an ongoing struggle with yourself, but it is not it, it is not the basis of your relationship with God. Christ is the basis of your relationship with God. What he did, his perfect obedience and his perfect sacrifice for your sins. As long as you're in Christ, as long as you trust in him, as far as God's concerned, you have a perfect relationship with him because Christ gave it to you. He is the foundation of our relationship with the Father. And he alone. That's why Paul was so upset when Galatians, where people were coming in and telling them, well, you must be circumcised also. Believe in Christ, but be circumcised. Paul said, told him to go to hell. Anathema, anathema be, that means may God destroy you and cast you into hell. That's how serious that was. Well, how much more gutting the atonement? How much more? 
This is not a little issue. This is not just a difference in opinion. This is not about theories. This is about the Scripture and what Christ actually did on the cross. And the purpose of that, as revealed in the Scriptures, especially by Paul in, in uh, uh, Romans and Galatians, if you, not, not just by Paul, though. Peter, John, they're quite, quite open about Hebrews. See, if, if you do not accept that, if you do not accept the substitutionary atonement, you're denying Christ. You're trampling his blood underfoot. Because, and you're, calling, you're, you're accusing God because you're saying that he sent his son into the world and he executed him as a criminal on a cross to make some kind of non-rational demonstration that makes would not demonstrate anything but God's injustice. Repent, if you believe that, uh, that doctrine, that teaching of the governmental view, you better repent. Because you have no atonement. You stand before God naked in your sins. Jesse Morrell, that's one of the guys I'm thinking of. He stands before naked, before God naked in his sin. He has no covering of Christ's righteousness. Christ's blood has not covered him. Because he's denied Christ's blood and seeks to stand in his own righteousness. There's others out there like him. Beware of them because they sound good. They, they exhort you to follow Christ and, and obey Christ and keep his commandments, just like the Pharisees did, the Jewish, uh, the Christian Pharisees. The followers, some of the, they were some of the followers of James. James changed his mind about some things, too. Uh, <clears throat> After the Jerusalem conference, Meg James said, "No, it's uh, you don't have to do all these rules. Uh, the the Gentiles aren't under the law, but uh, people that they don't realize they're blind. It's like you know Roger Olson if he holds to the the governmental view, he has no cross. The cross means nothing." Oh, you might, oh, yes, I believe it's important. It was important. It, doesn't, it can't save you. You're, you're not a Christian at all. You're not, you're not a Protestant, that's for sure. You're not an evangelical because evangelicalism, the cross has always been central. The cent centrality of the scriptures, the authority of scriptures, and of Christ, and of the cross, and of being born again. Those were the, the main elements of historic evangelicalism. Not anymore. Evangelicalism doesn't mean anything anymore because they've forgotten the cross. Just like uh, the, the church growth movement, Bill Hybels, Rick Warren, and all these others. Uh, the cross makes people uncomfortable, so they took the crosses out of their churches. Well, a lot of churches, they've took the cross out of the preach, out of their preaching long ago. Many Baptist churches, the cross is not central. They're not evangelicals. They're not Christian, really. They're, they're into popular religion. What pleases the people? The pastors will always be preaching out of the Old Testament. They don't, they don't understand the gospel. That the cross, it's essential not only to be to, at the beginning of salvation, but every day of our lives. You know, they're once saved, always saved. The one-time event. No, it's the beginning of your Christian life. And the gospel is always central to the Christian life. The cross is central to the Christian life every single day. It's not just some transaction in heaven. It's a life, a relationship with God through Christ and it's always through Christ. 
Our unity with God is through Christ. As he says in John chapter 17, in his prayer to the Father, So that is why I have to go to war, not a war I have chosen. The enemies of Christ have chosen to trample the blood of Jesus underfoot, to disparage the work of my Lord and Savior. Now I know when God saved me, the Holy Spirit testified to me. That because of Christ and him alone, what he did on the cross, I was right with God. All my sins, past, present, and future, were forgiven in him. So when you attack that, you're also attacking the testimony of God to me. Now, I'm not telling anybody else to believe in the gospel because of my experience. I'm just telling you to go to the scriptures and search out out the truth because it's spelled out right there in the open. And anybody that can't see it does not have the spirit of Christ in them, the spirit of truth. They may be very religious. They may claim to be Christians. They may have PhDs and THDs and everything else. They might write write many books. People like N.T. Wright. But if they deny the cross, disparage the cross, minimize the cross, they are not saved. They are not saved because God will not permit that. So, and if you're out there and you think that you're trusting in your own righteousness and, and how you live your life is the basis of your acceptance with God, Your obedience is the basis of your acceptance with God. I'll tell you what. You don't meet them. You don't meet God's standard. You do not meet his standard. Because his standard is Christ. If you're not as perfect as Christ. You will not stand in the judgment. If you claim you have sinless perfection, you have deceived yourself. And the truth is not in you, as the Apostle John writes. If we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves. You can't be perfect enough. You cannot have salvation without Christ. You know, there's an old saying that's outside the church There is no salvation. And that's sort of a truism outside of Christ's church. But it really is, the real truth is, is outside of Christ, there is no salvation. Because God's salvation is only in him and what he did on the cross. God has ordained us by through faith in Christ and Christ's works. His atonement in particular and his resurrection, which is a proof that he actually did atone for the sins of the world. If you don't believe that, if you don't trust in him, you are not saved. And you will be condemned at the judgment. Just be aware of that. I wasn't actually planning on preaching, but it just seems to come out. Thank you, Lord. I was going to say forgive me. but No way. No way am I going to apologize for preaching Christ and him crucified. If you don't like it, you don't have to listen.